Hi guys, in this video we'll be looking at an introduction to bacterial pathogens, meningitis, bacterial diseases in plants, tuberculosis transmission, tuberculosis pathogenesis, tuberculosis treatment and prevention, and then we'll finish with a summary. So although there are different types of organisms which can cause disease, a lot of those diseases and most diseases in humans are caused by bacteria. So bacteria act as pathogens as well. And there are many species of bacteria. Bacteria belong to one of the kingdoms called the Prokaryote kingdom. So remember there are five kingdoms, animals, plants, fungi, protist or protista, and we also have the Prokaryote kingdom. So this kingdom comprises various different species and types of bacteria. The prokaryotic cells are smaller than eukaryotic cells, so eukaryotic cells include animal and plant cells, but they can reproduce very, very rapidly. So just as a comparison, this would represent a eukaryotic cell, and this would represent a prokaryotic cell. And you'll notice that it's considerably smaller than the eukaryotic cell, and it's missing particular organelles and components of the eukaryotic cell but they reproduce much more quickly. Bacteria can be very harmful because they cause disease by damaging cells directly or releasing toxins. So they can either replicate inside of cells and become so large in number that they burst out, or they can release particular molecules known as toxins, and it's these toxins which can cause harm to our cells as well. Bacterial meningitis is a very serious disease. Meningitis comes in different forms, and you can also have viral meningitis, but in this case we're talking about the form that's caused by bacteria. So bacterial meningitis is a bacterial infection of the protective membranes which lie on the surface of the brain. So these protective layerings of the brain are known as the meninges, and there are three different layers of them. That's why it's called meningitis, and itis refers to inflammation. So essentially we have a bacterial infection which reaches these protective layers, and these protective layers are known as the meninges. And eventually they become inflamed, which is why we call it bacterial meningitis. Bacterial meningitis is usually caused by one of two species. That could be Streptococcus pneumoniae or Neisseria meningitidis. So they are the two names of the bacteria that commonly cause bacterial meningitis. The bacterial infection can also spread to the blood, causing septicemia or blood poisoning, which can lead to death unless it's treated very quickly. So septicemia basically refers to any time where we have an infection at a particular area of the body and the infection has managed to reach the bloodstream, which is very, very dangerous. The reason it's very dangerous is because the blood goes all around the body and it will take this pathogen and its poisons all around the body and cause lots of different problems. And if you have septicemia, it's a very serious case. So it can spread from the brain into the blood and septicemia will cause death unless it's treated immediately. Meningitis is very serious. About 10% of those that are infected will die, and 25% of them will be left with permanent brain or nerve damage. So 10% of people who get meningitis will end up dying. 25% get damage from the inflammation. So remember, the infection will cause lots of immune responses, and it can be very destructive to the brain tissue because it's lying very close to the brain itself. In terms of treatment, antibiotics can be used to treat meningitis if they're administered early enough, and vaccines can also protect against meningitis. So if the infection's already taken hold, antibiotics are very useful to tackle the bacteria, but only if it's in the early stages. Vaccines are used to prevent meningitis from occurring in the future, so many people in the UK get meningitis vaccines. We also see bacterial diseases in plants as well. So they can infect plants in very much a similar way and end up in various parts of the plant deep within the tissues. An example of this is a disease known as ring rot, and it's a bacterial disease found in tomatoes and potato plants. Ring rot basically causes the vascular tissues of the plant to break down and decay, and therefore it decreases the yield of potatoes and tomatoes. Vascular tissue tends to involve many vessels in the plant which are involved in carrying water and other chemicals, and this bacterium basically ends up destroying these vascular tissues, and so the transport of important chemicals is hindered, leading to these decaying areas found in the vegetables and a decreased yield. Tuberculosis, or TB, is another very important bacterial disease, which is a major problem in the world. The bacterium that causes it is called Mycobacterium tuberculosis, and it can be abbreviated as Mycobacterium TB, or M-tuberculosis. 
The TB bacterium normally infects the cells found in the lungs, but it can also spread to other parts of the body. So it usually travels down the airways into the tissues of the lungs, but again it can transport itself down towards the other organs as well. Specifically, the TB enters cells known as macrophages, and those are the macrophages found in the lungs, and it inhibits their lysosomes so that they're able to survive. So the macrophage, remember, is a type of white blood cell, and it's involved in engulfing particular pathogens, for example bacteria. And usually it uses lysosomes, which are an organelle found in most eukaryotic cells, to release digestive enzymes onto the bacterium to break it down. But in this case, the TB bacterium is able to inhibit the lysosomes and therefore it can survive. So it infects the macrophage and it can stay inside the macrophage. TB gets transmitted in droplets in the air, which can be inhaled. So if people are, for example, breathing or coughing into the air, droplets, which are very microscopic, can contain these bacteria. And of course, other people can breathe them in or of course touch them. And therefore it's very easily transmitted into each other's airways. So TB normally occurs as an infection after long periods of close contact with someone who has the infection. Because if you're spending lots of time with that person, you're often talking and there may be lots of droplets in the air and it's going to increase the rate or the risk of those bacteria entering the airways. So how does TB bring about its pathogenesis, i.e. how does it cause the disease? A person who's been infected with TB for the first time will get what we call primary TB. So the first time that the bacterium enters the human host, this will cause primary TB. In primary TB, the person's lungs will be infected because it's entered the airways and they'll experience fatigue, which is extreme tiredness, fever and loss of weight. So all of these symptoms, although they can be found in other diseases, tend to show up in the first infection of TB. In a healthy person, the primary TB would eventually be controlled by the immune system, even if it isn't completely cleared, and it won't develop any further. So the various cells of the immune system will start to recognise that there's an infection, and although they may not completely clear the TB, they will provide methods to control it and make sure that it's kept in a relatively stable environment. So this means the disease won't get any worse. However, if that person becomes immunocompromised, or if the TB infects someone who's already immunocompromised, the TB can develop further and become more dangerous, and this is called secondary TB. So for example, immunocompromised people tend to have very low activity immune systems, or maybe on medication that is inhibiting their immune system. So in secondary TB, if it's allowed to develop, the phagocytic cells begin to accumulate around these infected macrophages. So remember, TB exists inside a macrophage, and although the macrophage is a phagocyte itself, other phagocytes can start surrounding and start digesting this macrophage. This causes the cell death of those macrophages, and it ends up producing a lesion known as a granuloma. And many granulomas can build up in the lungs, and their chemical nature means that the lung tissue starts to be damaged and broken down. So you can compare healthy lung tissue with these granulomas, which are these lesions caused by digested and broken down infected macrophages. The granulomas can cause a lot of problems, for example, chest pain, and eventually they can lead to death. The TB itself can also be latent, which means that it's present in the body, but it's basically not actively replicating, so it doesn't cause any symptoms. So if someone does have TB inside of their lungs, it can be in a latent phase, whereby it's not replicating and so the symptoms are not developing because the lung tissue is not breaking down. However, it can quickly change from being latent to active, whereby it starts replicating and the lung tissue starts to break down and cause damage and therefore symptoms. So therefore, knowing the treatments and prevention methods for TB is very important. TB is more likely to spread when the living conditions are very overcrowded, where people are in close contact a lot of the time, or if the housing that people live in is very damp. So overcrowding can obviously increase the risk that droplets in the air can interact and spread to other people. And of course, if the housing and places that people live in are very damp, this can increase the moisture and the amount of environment that the TB can survive in. So we can improve living conditions to try and help prevent the spread of TB. So we go from being very damp and overcrowded housing to more sanitized and more spacious living 
which should help clear the infection away. Pulmonary TB, which is TB found in the lungs only, can be treated by extensive use of a combination of antibiotics over about six months. So it does take a long time, but various different antibiotics can be used over a six month period, and hopefully these will tackle the bacterium and end up killing all of them. However, it's becoming more and more difficult to treat TB because the mycobacterium has become resistant to some antibiotics. And this is happening with other diseases too. It's been given some antibiotics and by chance some of them will be resistant to this. And so if they replicate, the whole colony can be resistant. If the TB is resistant to two antibiotics, we call it multidrug resistant tuberculosis or MDR-TB. If the TB is resistant to three or more antibiotics, we call it extensively drug resistant tuberculosis or XDR-TB. Hey guys, I hope you enjoyed the video. If you are looking for an amazing A-level biology resource, join me today in my series of engaging bite-sized video tutorials. Just click the snap revised smiley face and together let's make A-level biology a walk in the park.